Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the first uh, complete event of What's Now Festival. It's our sixth festival, uh, sixth series of What Festivals uh, that run usually this time of year. Um, and uh, this year is a very different one. It's a, it's a festival where we've invited 20 artists to sleep, live, talk, develop work in the building uh, over four days. So we've already been here for two days. Uh, we've had one night here, all students together. Uh, we're using the building as a kind of, um, as a way of questioning things, how we operate together, how we produce, what is, what is it that we do as artists, whether we produce things for people to uh, admire, or whether we constantly um, are having to produce new things, what is our relationship to invention, what is our relationship to uh, production. So you will see traces around the building that reflect some of these practices. So I'd like to also say that the things that you come across are things that are all also unfinished. So they're, they're, they're part of a continuous process which we will finish on Thursday, um, Friday. Um, we, we've got also a premise that everyone that comes along um, in public opening times are also already somehow uh, participating, uh, already sort of involved in what we're doing. So we're, we're, we're trying to, and hopefully, welcome you into what we're doing. Um, and we will be doing that after this evening's talk, and maybe yeah, the moments between if we open up discussion. But we want this to be a, uh, yeah, as much a different kind of social uh, event as, a, as an art event. So I'm going to leave the introduction of the talk to Hamish, who's uh, Hamish McPherson, one of the four space holders who have been, uh, been involved in the planning of this festival, along with Katie Coe and Efrasini Botapapa. Uh, so I'll hand over to Hamish. Thank you. Um, so, hello. Uh, we're really pleased to have uh, Dr. Derek McCormick uh, join us this afternoon and this evening. First of all, speakers for what now 2014. Uh, Derek is an associate professor uh, of human geography at the School of Geography and Environment at the University of Oxford. Uh, last year published a um, book for frames for, uh, <laughs> for moving bodies, experience and experiment and effective spaces. Um, to get that right. uh, it's quite fitting that that includes the count of I think Derek's last visit to Swan Davis, which was uh, five years ago. Uh, Derek's now looking at atmospheric things and working a book on that subject. So please give a warm welcome to Derek McConnell. Thanks very much, Hamish, um, and also thank you, Frank for the invitation and to all the other participants uh, for your welcome this afternoon. So I've responded to the, the call for participation, I guess, or the call for uh, being here. Maybe participation is too strong a word. Um, which included a quote from uh, Barardi about everywhere being connected, um, about uh, uh, the fact that we're able to reach any place in the world and able to be reached um, from anywhere in the world. So that's the key line that I took out from the long passage that was in the um, kind of blurb for this event. And my response to the invitation is framed by that idea about connection, about being reached, um, connectivity, etc. And I'm going to discuss that or talk through that in relation to one thing. Um, at the end of it, uh, you may never want to hear about this thing again. You may be sick to death of this particular thing, but let's see how much weight it can bear. Um, so in May 2009, I spent a day in this building. I was here to participate in a workshop that explored the relationship between geography and choreography through a kind of collaborative diagramming. This workshop was, in turn, part of a series of events at various sites around the world 
organized loosely in response to propositions devised by a collective of people working in Montreal who operate under the name the Sense Lab. Among the participants on that day was Jill Clark and Sarah Rubbage. In the morning, we spent time downstairs sharing ideas before moving up to the studio space in the afternoon. What emerged in that space was a kind of tentative procedural architecture involving things and bodies in relational movement. What emerged was a kind of geographical game, I guess, of sorts, one that offered invitations to experiment, however, however modestly, with distance, speed, duration, and slowness. In some ways, what emerged began with a simple thing placed on the floor in the middle of the room, which I hope you can see, a laminated map of the world, which I had bought myself on the way to the event. In the middle of the room, the map worked as a kind of point of departure, a point around which different trajectories and pathways of movement emerged. And it was the last thing to leave the space. There I am, rolling it up. My interest here today is also with this uh, connection between geography and movement and things. I'm interested in these connections in relation to the question of how we might think about different senses and experiences of atmosphere as they gather around and are made palpable and present by things. This time, the thing in question is not a map, but a balloon. I didn't know it then, but this thing was also present in the room on that day in 2009. Last night, as I was looking through some of the images uh, for this presentation, I noticed that um, Jill was hanging some acetates from one of these benches. And I noticed that on one of these acetates was a design by an Italian Jesuit, Francesco Lana di Terzi, for a flying ship based upon evacuated copper spheres. His theory was that the sealed vacuums would be lighter than air and would allow the craft to fly. He also noted that God will never allow that such a machine be built, but because everybody realizes that no city would be safe from raids, iron weights, fireballs, and bombs could be hurled from such a great height. So I never asked Jill about the things in that acetate. I had no idea that they were there until last night. But they're the kinds of things that I want to talk about today. So dance, choreography, somatic practice don't figure so obviously and directly in what I want to do. But I hope as the discussion develops, the connections between those themes and um, my talk will become clearer. Certainly human, bo uh, human bodies and non-human bodies will figure. So used frequently in a range of contexts to capture the affective qualities or the alluring thisness of space times, atmospheres have long been the focus of different domains of expertise in the performing arts, in event management, in retail marketing, and in store design by people like Primark. Over the past decade or so, many in the social sciences and humanities, including geographers, have been trying to make sense of atmospheres as kind of relational affective space times, trying to make sense of atmospheres as dynamic distributions of feeling generated as part of what the late Teresa Brennan called the transmission of affect. Atmospheres as relatively discrete and contained space times, theaters, railway carriages, stadiums, or stores, and atmospheres of space times of much greater extent and duration. The feel of an economic crisis, a period of, a period of political instability, or a state of emergency. So whatever their scale and duration, atmospheres are modulated in all kinds of ways by devices and technologies of different kinds designed to move bodies, to move them to become more responsive. And yet, as geographer Ben Anderson has put it, Atmospheres are always excessive of these efforts. Something always escapes. And this kind of indeterminate affective excess. So atmospheres are not only affective. They're also gaseous or meteorological. Atmosphere names a turbulent zone surrounding the Earth, a zone which sustains different forms of life and which is subject to incalculable variation at a range of scales. The properties of gaseous atmospheres are made explicit and incorporated into spheres of human life through technologies of measurement 
and prediction. But they also become explicit through how they are felt and experienced as different kinds of what Tim Ingold might call phenomenological weather worlds. So something about the affective life of meteorological atmospheres is always excessive of human experience, however. Atmospheric affects take place as so many changes of temperature, pressure, and velocity that shape the duration and differential mattering of various forms of life beyond the human. These affects are expressed in the color of leaves, in the cracking of rock, in the altitude and movement of things. They're expressed, for instance, in the movement of the ballooning spider as it takes to the air. There's another sense in which we can understand atmosphere. Atmosphere is a kind of ambient informational milieu throughout which attention is distributed and modulated. Atmosphere as an environment for agitating attention through multiple solicitations to respond. Atmosphere as the ongoing charging of perception to be affected by a cloud of solicitations, a cloud of possibilities. So in some ways then, we might say that attention is becoming more atmospheric. Certainly this is the sense of atmosphere to which Berardi is gesturing in the quote I mentioned at the outset. So atmospheres can be foregrounded or backgrounded to different extents. Effectively, they can linger below the threshold of shared palpability before precipitating through a gesture. Meteorologically, they can disappear into the blue of a clear day before becoming explicit in the shape of a cloud or in the taste of dust in the air or as you rub your hand over the bonnet of a car. Informationally, they remain latent until pulled into shape by the color and tone of an ad or a tune or a sign. But atmospheres are also made explicit, made palpable, and made potentially, potentially actionable via the presence and movement of things, so discrete, shaped, formed things. As political theorist Jane Bennett argues, to attend to things is not to gra ground uh, thinking in objects. It's to cultivate attention to the properties and qualities of things as they participate in ecologies that are much wider than themselves. So encounters with discrete things can unsettle and surprise thinking, making it responsive, perhaps, both to the qualities of those things and to the worlds in which they are implicated. There's another sense of things, things as happenings in process, things as occasions of experience. Something happening is the process by which worlds, however minor, take shape. This is anthropologist Kathleen Stewart's sense of things, much less discreet, far more atmospheric. Things happening as diffuse yet palpable gatherings of force, Atmospheric things, then, are relatively discrete, shaped forms that draw our attention to and through the clouds of relations and processes in which they are immersed. <coughs> the device with which I'd like to think about doing atmospheric things is the balloon. The balloon, both in the air and on the ground, as it participates in experience and experiments through which atmospheres are made explicit in a whole range of ways, brought to our attention. The balloon, as it is used variously as a credible scientific instrument, an object of allure, whimsy, grief, amusement, and as a vehicle for aesthetic experiment. The balloon is an only ever partially dirigible device, a device that invites a certain circumstantial waywardness in the telling of its stories, a device that reflects us in all kinds of directions. To think with the balloon is to become responsive to the ways of moving it affords. In some respects, this is about elevation, about ascension, about becoming vertical, and it's about new ways of looking, about a way of seeing the world from above, a world that unrolls under you, cartographic, map-like. Of a flight above London in the mid-19th century, the balloonist and scientist James Glacier wrote, the view was indeed wonderful, the plan-like appearance of London and its suburbs, the map-like appearance of the country generally, and the winding Thames leading the eye to the white cliffs at Margate and on to Dover. But it was not only about the view from above. It was about new ways of being in the air, of becoming an atmospheric body. Glacier wrote elsewhere that travel in the balloon leaves the observer free to note the phenomena by which he is surrounded. With the ease of an ascending vapor, he, he rises into the atmosphere, carried by the imprisoned gas. 
which responds with the alacrity of a sentient being to every external circumstance and lends obedience to the slightest variation of pressure, temperature, or humidity. The responsiveness of the balloon to its surroundings, its agreement with those surroundings, was experienced in the body as a curious sense of stillness and movement. Albert Santos Dumont described it thus, we were off, going at a speed of the air current in which we now lived and moved. Indeed, for us, there was no more wind. And this is the first great fact of spherical ballooning. Infinitely gentle is this unfelt movement forward and upward. Experiences like this prompted reflection on the nature of the body aloft. In Aeronautica, or sketches illustrative of the theory and practice of aerostation, published in 1838, Monk Mason wrote, the human body is composed of a variety of different materials, of different specific gravities, and endowed with different degrees of sensibility to pressure or other disturbing causes to which they may happen to be subject. When these are all set in motion together by one and the same impelling force, a very considerable disarrangement of their relative positions must ensue. It was not just about becoming atmospheric aloft. It was also about new experiences of atmosphere on the ground, about moving bodies to look up in an act of collective public witnessing. It was about an earlier version of what geographer Fraser MacDonald calls sublime verticality, the neck craning, eye straining awe at witnessing the propulsion of a vehicle into the Earth's atmosphere. But it was not just about looking up. The prospect of a balloon launch generated atmospheres of shared experience that could be and needed to be managed as far as that was possible with such a free-to-air spectacle. In 1784, the Italian Vincenzo Lenardi undertook one of the first aerial voyages in England from St. George's Fields, London, now the site of Marble Arch, an event attended by up to 150,000 spectators. Lunardi knew how to mix chemistry and charisma. He possessed an acute sense of the value of anticipation to the intensity of the promised event, and he had learned from experience that a crowd gathered in anticipation is a volatile collective. Eager to avoid being lynched, in the hours before the launch, he divided his attention between the hydrogen and the mood of the crowd. At some point, realizing that the process of inflation would not be completed before the appointed time and not wanting to get killed, he made a decision to begin his ascent before the balloon was fully inflated. And so, in his words, at five minutes after two, the last gun was fired, the cords divided, and the balloon rose. The effect was that of a miracle on the multitudes which surrounded the place, and they passed from incredulity and menace into the most extravagant expressions of approbation and joy. From the outset then, the balloon was a device for moving bodies through atmospheres, for generating affects around the promise of this movement, and for capturing attention in the process. Lunardi brought paddles with him, and from time to time during his journey to a site near what is now South Mim's service station, he paddled away in the vain hope that it might help him influence his direction of travel. In the late 18th century, it only seemed a matter of time before the problem of dirigibility might be solved. But as the late 18th century gave way to the 19th, this hope gave way gradually to a realization that this was not going to happen, that the best that might be achieved was a form of very partial dirigibility, to be achieved by taking advantage of the speed and direction of the wind. In Jules Verne's Five Weeks in a Balloon, three, air, three aerial explorers set out to travel across Africa. Their plan is to use the prevailing winds at different altitudes. For Verne, the balloon was a vehicle for a kind of semi-random wandering, linking different sites according to prevailing circumstances. And his novel becomes a series of landing sites strung together by lines of open-ended drift, lines traced via the ongoing process of ascension and descending expansion and contraction. James Glacier also agreed he, start, he wrote, we start from a given point to go where chance directs. The compass we carry with us, not that we may steer our course along a given route, but trace by it the erratic and ungoverned movements of the machine that carries us. We traverse, perhaps, the segment of a huge circle, the line of our path in space. We proceed and return, advance onward, now gently, now with velocity.
these are what philosopher Michel Serre, who's particularly attentive to the qualities of Verne space-time machines called strange journeys. For Sir, to travel and indeed think with this device is to undertake what he calls vi voyages through a plurality of spaces by means of an exfoliated multiplicity of maps. As he continues, one must lose oneself from space to space, from circle to circle, from map to map, according to chance, along the thread. So to take Sayre seriously means thinking of the balloon as an imaginative conceptual device with which to embark on strange journeys. It is to engage in a kind of wandering circumstantial storying. On April the 13th, 1844, a balloon story appeared under the following headline in a special supplement to the New York Sun. Astounding news by Express via Norfolk. The Atlantic crossed in three days. Signal triumph of Mr. Monk's, Mr. Monk Mason's flying machine. The Sun was a penny daily, the most successful of a new type of newspaper, whose emergence, growth, and circulation had been made possible by advances in print technology. It was sold on street corners by a network of newsboys. And the author of this story, Edgar Allan Poe, understood the power of these newspapers to circulate stories and their effects. He also understood the importance of the formal properties of the successful hoax. His tale was full of technical description and rep reproduced a journal of the experience of the aeronauts. The balloon hoax sent up the machining production of news and news stories whose affects were consumed by increasingly mesmerized subjects. And it did this so successfully that Poe could not lay his hands on a copy of the edition in which his story appeared. You can't see this. Seven years later, on October the 5th, 1851, a Mrs. Russell and her family sat down for lunch at their home near Gloucester in England. They noticed a balloon in the garden, and a servant was dispatched to recover it. The balloon had a message attached. Erebus, 112 degrees west longitude, 71 degrees north latitude, September the 3rd, 1851, blocked in. By that point, John Franklin's expedition had been missing for six years in the Arctic. Search parties had launched balloons of their own, like this one, of which is a fragment, in the hope that they might reach Franklin. The Admiralty conducted an investigation determining that while not impossible for a balloon to travel at 3,500 miles or so from Fra Franklin's undetermined location to Gloucestershire, this one probably had not. After it was discovered that he was not in the large foil balloon that had floated across Colorado in October 2009, Falcon Heen, son of Richard, declared that, you guys said that we did this for the show. As with Poe, the event was really about the machinic production and circulation of stories. As one commentator put it, for several hours on Thursday, Richard Heen's publicity stunt mesmerized US networks as they scrambled to broadcast live footage of the flying saucer-shaped balloon fear to be carrying his six-year-old son. Yet, within 48 hours, the drama was exposed as a sham, leaving many outlets wondering how they had been duped by a man who claims to be a descendant of aliens and who once had a close encounter in a fast food restaurant bathroom. Another commentator lamented, now it's instantaneous, there's no research, no thoughtful producing, it's all about getting a story, getting it on the air and getting viewers. And what that translates into is this kind of hysterical journalism which feeds on itself. There really is no perspective anymore. Eleven years after, after the publication of Poe's hoax, in 1855, Samuel Goodrich published a different kind of fictional balloon story. This one was more worthy, but no less fantastical, because it assumed the possibility of a perfectly dirigible balloon. It was an educational travelogue of sorts, under the unwieldy title of The Balloon Travels of Robert Mary and His Young Friends Over Various Countries in Europe. For Mary, the balloon was a vehicle for doing geography, and he invited some young friends along. Initially, they expressed some skepticism. Suppose I do hire a balloon. Will you and James and Ellen and Seth and Peter go with me and travel over the world? Are you really in earnest, Mr. Mary? To be sure I am. Of course we will go. Don't be too sure of that, Laura. Is it not dangerous, Mr. Mary? A little dangerous, perhaps, but think of the pleasure we shall have in sailing along over hills and mountains, lakes and streams, towns and cities. It'll be a capital mode of studying geography. The land and sea lying all spread out before us like a map. Certainly, 
But where shall we go? We can go where we like. I want to go to Jerusalem. I want to go to Egypt. I want to go to Mount Etna. I want to pass over London and Paris and Constantinople and everywhere else. I want to believe. I want to believe that geography balloon lessons can fold strange circumstances together through the wanderings of the wind-blown independent traveler. From the Shoreham Herald, October the 30th, 2011, reception pupils at St. Peter's Primary in Sullingdon Way, Shoreham, released 29 balloons to mark the end of their Percy the Park Keeper topic. They had been reading one of the Percy stories, The Hedgehog's Balloon, and teacher Caroline Hodge thought the balloon race would be a great treat for the end of term. They were very excited, said Mrs. Hodge. It was lovely because it was such a clear day and they could see the balloons go for miles. As well as reading Percy stories, the children had also been learning geography and finding out about their place in the world. How far, really how far, might a balloon with a message attached actually travel? Three-year-old James Dodds has an answer. In July 2011, he, re he released a balloon from Peterborough, England, with his name and address attached. Three weeks later, he received a reply from Garachi Kliuch near the Black Sea, 1,800 miles away. Abby, Ella, and Peter Gardner have an answer. On New Year's Day 2011, they released a balloon from their garden in Bolton. Four months later, they received a postcard from Laos from a man who claimed to have found the balloon near the Mekong River. Their mother, Wendy, remarked, I'm really surprised that the balloon traveled so far. We'd only put a first-class stamp on it because we thought it might get to Cornwall or Wales. We didn't expect it to reach the other side of the world. And Alice Maines has an answer. On July the 15th, 2007, Alice, then four, released her balloon. I just let go, she said. Rising above Flixton Junior School in Manchester, Alice's balloon carried a numbered ticket promising to find her a very special prize, a visit to Chester Zoo. Her father, Andrew, remarked, it didn't seem to get very far. I thought it won't even make the next street. So I want to believe that in being released, in this appearing, thus the balloon withdraws from the sphere of human influence, entering a strange zone in which it only has relations with other things and other agencies, all of which, not all of which are benign, of course. The balloon may be a killer, a fire starter, or the cause of power outages. More benignly, the excursion undertaken by Alice's balloon might open a strange kind of wormhole to elsewhere, disclosing a world which, left to its own devices, might just return something. This is a topological world in which far can suddenly become very near. On September the 5th, a letter arrived at Alice's school. Her balloon had been found in China by 26-year-old Ziyu Fei, who returned it to Alice with a message attached. I want to believe. Something about the act of release makes a difference. Too many people continue to do it for it to be otherwise. We could say it's all about the symbolism of the act, about hopes for the transcendence of something more than substantial. Release is, however, always a kind of multi-effective event, one that turns now around the assumption that whatever we release might just disappear, or now around the hope that it might show up for someone, for some, somewhere, for something, even if it might not be us. Something remembered, that question that you posed one evening after bedtime stories about what happens when we die. Who finds us? I don't know, someone will find you. In October 2012, Reiner Gumprich, 68, found a balloon with a note attached while he was out picking mushrooms in Westerkapellen, Germany. The message read, in support of Karina Menzies, you will be missed, you are such an amazing person, RIP, Liani, Nikki, and Megan, and Karis. Karina Menzies, a 31-year-old mother of three, had been killed a few days earlier in an alleged hit and run. The balloon bearing the message had been released in Cardiff. When I was younger, before I knew better, I had hoped they might travel to the edge of space, or even beyond, that they might always continue to ascend. Now I know otherwise. In the short story, Fire Balloons, part of the Martian Chronicles, Ray Bradbury tells of priests who travel from Earth to Mars, looking for creatures of goodwill. They find beings that, having long since left their bodies behind, now take the form of phosphorescent blue balloons, living in the wind and the skies and the hills. 
An encounter with these creatures generates a memory for one of the priests, which Bradbury drew from his own childhood. Bradbury remembers the dim faces of dear relatives long dead and mantled with moss as grandfather lit the tiny candle and let the warm air breathe up to form a balloon plumply luminous in his hands. A shining vision which they held, reluctant to let go, for once released, it was yet another year gone from life, another fourth, another bit of beauty vanished. I get choked up every time as I let go and watch it take off. This is how pastor Eric Foley describes his experience of launching balloons from a point in South Korea near the North Korean border. Foley and his wife have been launching these balloons since 2006 under the auspices of an organization they founded in 2002 called Seoul USA. Since 2003, another organization, Fighters for a Free North Korea, has launched approximately two million balloons across the border carrying 10 million leaflets in addition to USB drives and radios. In 2013, its director Park Sang-hak was a recipient of the Vaclav Havel Prize for Creative Descent, awarded at a ceremony in Oslo. Commenting upon the prize, he remarked, this prize is not for me alone. It is for the 25,000 North Korean refugees who are fighting against the dictatorship of North Korea. It is for the helium balloons that deliver our weapons of truth. From 1951 until the end of that decade, almost 600,000 clear polyethylene balloons containing 300 million leaflets, posters, books, and freedom scrolls signed by Americans were released from Germany to be carried by the wind in the direction of Eastern Bloc countries. These balloon launches, known as balloon casts, were carried out under the aegis of Radio Free Europe and the Free Europe Press. They were undertaken as part of a much, much, war, uh, much larger project of domestic political mobilization known as the Crusade for Freedom. The balloon launches in Europe were mirrored by similar events, albeit at a smaller scale in the USA. In October 1915, 1950, a thousand helium balloons carrying freedom scrolls were released from the Empire State Building. Celebrities also often attended balloon races in order to endorse the crusade. Clark Gable launched balloons from Reno with instructions attached for how the finder might return them. Concerned citizens could sponsor balloons. The message was, now for the first time, your crusade for freedom has been able to intensify its tough idea war with communist rulers, with written words, messages carried in balloons blown by the winds of freedom deep into the captive countries. This new and dramatic means of piercing the curtain is a significant step. In 1960, a message from President Dwight Eisenhower was transmitted across the United States. The message went, this is one more significant step in the United States program of space research and exploration, being carried forward for peaceful purposes. The satellite balloon, if you want to get a sense of its scale, there's a car there. The satellite balloon, which has reflected these words, may be used freely by any nation for similar experiments in its own interest. Eisenhower's message was transmitted from the West Coast, bounced off this huge aluminized Mylar balloon, the world's first passive orbiting satellite, before being received in a specially constructed antenna in New Jersey. The Echo balloon continued to orbit for well over eight years, during which time it facilitated a range of experiments. But against the backdrop of the launch of the Sputnik satellite a few years earlier, the Echo satellite became an object of affective allure and interest. Visible from the ground, its regular orbits were the focus of curiosity and wonder, amplified by its appearance in newspapers and magazines. And its presence in the sky also pointed to the emergence of a new kind of system of transmission, promising connectivity and immediacy through a network that linked atmospheric devices with technologies on the ground. A few years after the Echo Balloon Project, an engineer at Bell Labs, Billy Kluver, collaborated with Andy Warhol on another balloon experiment, this time under the aegis of the organization called Experiments in Art and Technology. As Kluver relates, a colleague found a material called Scotch Pack, which the US Army had been using to vacuum pack sandwiches. 
The material was relatively impermeable to helium and could be heat sealed. Andy asked if he could make clouds. While we were figuring out how to heat seal curves, Andy took the material and simply folded it over and made his silver clouds. When they were shown in 1966, the heat gradient between the floor and the ceiling created a slight pressure differential. And with paper clips as ballast, we balanced them so they would float halfway between the ceiling and the floor. What emerged was silver clouds, a work in which large numbers of metallized pillar-shaped balloons filled with helium and oxygen float through a given space. The movement of the balloons is um, constantly agitated by uh, fans that blow gently in the room. Merce Cunningham incorporated some of Warhol's balloons in the 1968 work Rainforest. I was with Jasper Johns at an, expedition, or an exhibition, and Andy's pillows were just piled in a corner. I immediately thought they would be marvelous on stage because they moved, and they were light, and they took light. So I asked Andy. As choreographic objects, the balloons were free, unmanageable, untethered things that added a certain sense of dynamic spaciousness to the stage. To work with them required a particular way of moving them. Cunningham relates, you have to push, not kick, to get them to float. When we first did Rainforest, they, o they only had uh, one rehearsal, and a lot of the uh, pillows went into the audience. In the late 1960s, a large, in a large airship hangar in Santa Ana, California, a large balloon dome was inflated. Made from aluminized melanex, a material like mylar, from the outside the dome was remarkably similar to the echo balloon. From inside, the effect was like being in a strange spherical mirror. The dome was the centerpiece of the Pepsi Pavilion at the 1970 Osaka Expo a project that involved over 75 artists and engineers led by Billy Kluver. Hoping to develop new kinds of atmospheric brand association, executives at Pepsi had deliberately sought out countercultural figures in, 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 uh, in New York. Kluver's vision for the pavilion, at the heart of which was the mirrored balloon dome and a programmable sound system, was an environment for experimenting experience in which performers and audiences were co-participants, co-producers. As Erdman comments, the pavilion was intended to perform as an ambient machine in which hardware is subsumed by the atmospheric effects of software. Elsewhere, Fred Turner has argued that the Pepsi pavilion linked the countercultural tendencies of collaborative experiments between artists and engineers and the ideas, technologies, and practices of military industrial research and corporate management, rather than exemplifying some kind of critique of dominant ideological tendencies, Turner argues that the Pepsi Pavilion typifies the key elements of a cultural formation dedicated to soft control, cybernetic agency, and American political hegemony. We're using the sunlight, we're using the wind, we're using all of these things to build this network in the sky. This is how one of the engineers on the Google Loon project describes what it's all about. We can sail with the wind and shape the waves and patterns of these balloons so that when one balloon leaves, another balloon is set to take its place. So this Google Loon project is a dream of angels aloft, a dream of what Michel Serre called message-bearing systems, characterized by a circulation of messengers. These are systems in which we have the constructed networks in which we live and all the various forms of circulation and the world of physical fluxes, like the wind. This is a dream of being everywhere, always on, always connected, a dream in which the distinction between atmosphere in an informational, affective, and meteorological sense is no longer clear. A dream in which being and becoming atmospheric is taken to be a necessary condition of our relation with the world, with each other, and with whatever else we presume to be present. It's also a dream of partial dirigibility and choreogra choreographic possibilities aloft. A dream not of mastering the elements like the wind, but of using them by moving with them. There is, of course, good reason to be skeptical of these dreams. This is a dream in which, to use Berardi's words, we can reach every point in the world, but more importantly, we can be reached from any point in the world. Berardi could be writing promotional material for Facebook's recently announced connectivity lab. Every one of us, everywhere, connected or for Lockheed Martin's high-altitude airship project, always there, always on. For some of us, this is a nightmare. 
the kind of nightmare in which we are followed around and eventually enveloped by one of those sinister self-dirigible spheres named Rover that featured in The Prisoner, a British TV series of the late 1960s. But it might not be so bad if we imagined that we were always followed around by balloons, or if we could render explicit the trail of balloons that we leave behind, if we could see the volumes of the spheres we produce, In the opening pages of the first volume of his Spheres trilogy, the German philosopher Peter Sloterdijk, using a painting by John Everett Millet, dwells briefly upon the example of a child blowing a bubble, drawing attention to the process in which the bubble floats away, watched by the child before bursting into nothingness. For Sloterdijk, there's a solidarity between the soap bubble and its blower that excludes the rest of the world. I hope you can see the bubble just about. The blower is temporarily outside himself during this journey, coexisting with the bubble in a field spread out through attentive involvement. However, for much of the time, we don't experience this sense of attentive involvement with the volumes of gas we exhale, nor can we see the volumes of gas we produce through the various machines and technologies we use. We do have devices, of course, light switches with stickers reading, think about climate change pasted beside them, energy meters, etc. And yet it remains difficult to make these volumes explicit. In 2005, the Victoria State Government in Australia fun uh, funded an advertising campaign intended to demonstrate how much greenhouse gas was being released from domestic sources. What became known as the Black Balloon Campaign featured helium balloons emerging, emerging from a variety of domestic appliances before rising into the air. In one of these ads, balloon escapes uh, from residential properties, rising in countless numbers to the sky. In another, the balloons are trapped in a home. Each balloon represents 50 grams of greenhouse gas. In just one month, the average home produces 20,000 of them. If you don't see the impact now, it's your children who will. You have the power to make a difference to climate change. Authorised by the Victorian Government, Melbourne. There's a real relentless sense of urgency and agency to these balloons as they make their presence felt in the ads. They, they appear possessed with intention, striving to escape the confines of the domestic appliances and environments from which they are being issued and extruded. And if I was that child, I'd also be a little freaked out. On the face of it, the black balloons represent the weight in grams of greenhouse gas, but what they really foreground is the volume of this gas, the amount of space it might occupy. If the painting by John Everett Millay foregrounds some kind of existential relation between the individual and the thing to which it has given birth, the black balloon campaign shows how this relation is no longer visible while remaining even more complex, more essential to our forms of life. It renders explicit the relation between the issuing of volumes of gas into the atmosphere and the networks of devices, practices, and technologies upon which this process depends. The Pincushion Man is a 1935 animated short directed by Ub Ewerks. It features a land populated by human balloons in which every object is a balloon and in whose existence is threatened when the gate to the evil that lurks outside is opened, evil embodied in the figure of the pincushion man. <laughs> Once inside, he wreaks havoc with his pins before the inhabitants of balloon land eventually rid themselves of his destructive presence by covering him in latex rubber, rubber thick enough to hide any sharp points. So here are some points. Atmospheric things are relatively shaped forms that draw our attention to the clouds of relations and association, associations in which they are immersed. And the capacity to do atmospheric things is a particular kind of soft, effective power, or in Jane Bennett's words, thing power. Perhaps we are witnessing new ways of mobilizing and experimenting with this thing power, in which the capacity to draw together and choreograph different senses of atmosphere is crucial. Companies like Google and Facebook are major players in this kind of experimentation, in part because they're the only people with enough money to fund it. But it's also because such experiments fit with the kinds of atmospheric power upon which they trade. 
This power is about market share and connectivity, of course, but it also has a certain kind of aesthetic, one defined by the affective value of ambient atmospheres in relation to which different domains of life, technology, and expertise are seen to be increasingly blurred. To be connected is a human right, as Facebook reminds us. Skies painted with unnumbered sparks is a 2014, 2014 work by the artist Janet um, Eckelman, developed in collaboration with Aaron Koblin, creative director of the data arts team in the Google Creative Lab. This work was installed between buildings in downtown Vancouver this past March. Over 700 feet long, it consists of braided synthetic fiber knotted together between buildings. This is a particular kind of air-conditioned atmospheric thing. Air-conditioned because its material form and construction are designed to take into account the speed and force of the wind. And atmospheric in the sense that its shape and movement unfold in response to local expressions of more general atmospheric phenomena. And because its illumination is shaped by the movements of those who connect wirelessly with it. As the publicity material accompanying the work puts it, at night the sculpture came to life as visitors were able to choreograph the lighting in real time using physical gestures on their mobile, mobile devices. The project team is explicit about how the sculpture is not just a moving artifact, but a mesh work of synthetic fiber moving with the wind onto which is projected a web browser. In fact, as they put it, the lighting on the sculpture is actually a single full screen Google Chrome window over 10 million pixels in size. So there's something at stake in these experiments. What's at stake is the way in which air and atmosphere become explicit as matters of ethical and aesthetic concern. The way in which this process, process takes place matters, perhaps as part of a more general effort to make sense of the complex entanglements of human forms of life and the other forms of life, geological forces and elemental energies from which new worlds are taking shape under the name of the Anthropocene. At stake here, perhaps, are distinctive kinds of ethical and aesthetic sensibilities that may be informed by these things and that these things may inform. So perhaps it may become important ethically, aesthetically, politically to experiment with atmospheric things in a range of ways that may be inevitably implicated in Google's dream while also open to other possibilities. One way might be to seek out other stories that run counter to these dreams, sorry, stories of drift, of stillness, of getting lost, of letting go, of things showing up unannounced, unbidden. Circumstantial stories that play around with the problem and promise of dirigibility. Another way might be through choreographic and artistic projects that could disclose new worldly sensibilities through different kinds of atmospheric things aloft that might involve ways of ballooning, that use wind, solar energy, etc., to create monumental forms of being in the air that are far less instrumental than Google's vision. Or in a very different vein, it might involve playing around with the failure of things to move in the way we want them to. It might involve valuing their recalcitrance, their agency, their capacity to get lost, to become untethered, to disrupt in their own way, perhaps highly choreographed atmospheres, to move in ways over which we sometimes have no control. At the end of his speech, he stepped away from the lectern. At that point, 100,000 red white and balloon, uh, blue balloons were scheduled to drop on John Kerry and the delegates attending the 2004 Democratic National Convention in Boston. The balloons seemed hesitant, however, reluctant to fall from their nets in the rafters. As the interval between the end of the speech and the plan the balloon drop lengthened, convention producer Don Misher, member of the Event Industry Hall of Fame and recipient of 15 Emmy Awards, started to become increasingly agitated. Some balloons did fall but only in small numbers or as scattered individuals. Without their arrival in any significant numbers, the immediate effective intensity of the moment following the end of Kerry's address began to dissipate, and Misher knew it. He could feel it. We need more balloons. I want all the balloons to go, goddammit. Go, confetti, more confetti. I want more balloons. What's happening to the balloons? We need more balloons. We need all of them coming down. Go, balloons. Balloons, what's happening, balloons? There's not enough coming down. All balloons. What the hell? There's nothing falling. What the fuck are you guys doing up there? We want more balloons coming down. 
At some point, someone noticed that Misha's words were being broadcast live on CNN, <laughs> and the feed was cut to be followed by an apology, an explanation by the network. It might be a bad omen, they said. Before he lost to Reagan, Jimmy Carter had also had a bad time with balloons. His speech to the 1980 Democratic Convention was followed by an underwhelming balloon drop. Carter, unlike Reagan, got no convention with bands. He didn't have a way with balloons. I have a lot of time for arguments about non-human agency, but I'm not willing to go as far as to say that balloons win elections. I do find myself agreeing with Don Misher that atmospheres really matter and that things matter to how atmospheres matter. It was an unseasonably warm afternoon in early October and the party was only a few blocks away. Your friend, the birthday boy, whom I didn't really know and still don't, was there. He was three and in honor of the occasion he'd been given a large helium-filled purple foil balloon in the shape of the number he was celebrating. It floated in our midst, a kind of centerpiece for the event, and it had been weighted, but as we were to discover, not securely enough. A little later, as we gathered in the garden to eat cake, someone cried out, something was happening. You all looked up as it floated away. Everything momentarily heightened. The gasp, audible, dismay, faint or not, at the departure. It might not get very far, you might be able to find it, and indeed it seemed to hesitate briefly over the trees, as if it might fall back to earth but it continued on, upwards. You were surprised at how long you were able to track its ascent. You lost sight of it momentarily, but someone else found its shape again and pointed there. Your eye followed the line to a dot descending along a near-perfect diagonal into the distance. For a moment, it appeared to move with direction, as if possessing some sense of its own trajectory. You followed it for as long as you could, as long as it was polite in company, knowing that as soon as you took as soon as you took your eyes away, the thing itself would disappear. And it did. And what remained for an undetermined time was a sense that something had happened, the sense of a shared, if never really homogeneous atmosphere, felt in the minor qualitative transformation of the relations across and between bodies and things and the specific form of their gatherings. Thank you. <laughs>